Hey everyone, it's the weekend and that means it's time for another Digital Foundry Direct. Pretty interesting one we got lined up for you this week. Uh, we usually begin the program by talking about what we've been up to this week. And uh, well, the subject of this one is essentially all of Alex's workload this week. So yes, joining me from Berlin, Alex Batalia. Hey there, Richard, how are you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's, a, it's an absolute pleasure. Of course, it can only be. <laughs> so yeah, let's, let's get straight to the meat and drink of it. We'll talk about what I've been up to um, after the, uh, the main content of this Direct, which is to follow on from your video on upgrading the Ryzen 7 1700X to the Ryzen 9 3900X, which is an upgrade that has been eagerly anticipated, not just by you, not just by me, but uh, the thousands of Twitter followers you have, where you, <laughs> it's kind of been like a boyish megalomania. <laughs> yeah, it, it has been just posting what's going on while building the rig. And as soon, the first boot up moment was actually really awesome. I was not expect, usually when you build a rig, sometimes there's always like, oh, a cable's loose for some reason, or the mem test fails on the first boot and you need to switch slots or something like that. But this time, perfect boot. Everyone was happy and a long time coming for me because underneath all my videos, ever since I at least got the RTX 2080 Ti here to do my videos with and showcase the PC versions of games at 4K and usually 60 FPS if I can, there's been so many comments under the videos. I can just put them in here. Why are you pairing this with the 1700X? Why are you pairing that GPU with the 1700X? And I mean, we did it basically at the time to show Ryzen performance in games, uh, but over time, you know, it's, uh, it's finally great to uh, be in the land of the modern. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, just to talk about what we're going to do in this video, um, I was thinking about doing a 3900X review. Mm -hmm. um, but fundamentally, if we look at this uh, readout here, it pretty much tells the story of gaming on the 3900X, which is that essentially it's a few points better than the 3700X, yeah. or the same, or slightly worse. Yeah. Um, so there isn't really a story for me <laughs> to tell you here, except, um, well, well, we'll stack it up against the 9900K a bit, a bit further on down the road. But um, when I did the 3700X review, uh, I just thought for $330 for everything you get in that package, for the quality of the surrounding ecosystem, the fact that you can do memory overclocking on just about any board and that this helps performance, uh, the fact you get a cooler in the box. <laughs> it's a pretty amazing package, but Intel is still faster for gaming. Now, what we're seeing in the benchmarks, and we will go through some games uh, in a bit more depth a bit later, is that, you know, essentially um, the 9900K scales above the 9700K in gaming, not by a huge amount, possibly not enough to justify the additional price point, but you are getting additional scaling that arguably you aren't getting with the 3900X. So for a gaming processor, the 3700X is pretty, pretty damn good, but everything that you'd want from a $500 processor that you're getting from the 3900X it's going to be non-gaming in nature. Yeah, that's also what I would say based upon looking at our 3700X versus 3900X benches. For me though, that non-gaming application was a huge deal kind of coming up from the 1700X, which did non-gaming application, I would say, uh, for video editing, always rather it did it very well, at least on my end. But at the moment when I would move off the video editing timeline to put things into HEVC, or I would say 4K H.264, that's when my entire production process would slow down. And that is the main upgrade for me, actually, on 3900X for my day-to-day -day life. Um, mm -hmm. For gaming versus the 1700X, it's on a kind of case-by-case -case basis as well in some aspects. I would say uh, those extra cores and threads are not the main difference as to what we're seeing in the performance numbers that are in my video. Uh, rather, yeah. it's the IPC improvements, that larger cache, and also the fact that the frequency is so much higher while you're gaming and multiple threads are in use. I did watch your video last night um, and I, I checked out some of the stuff you were talking about there. Seems that older games 
I suspect because of the game cash, <laughs> uh, the, the, the older games do extremely yeah. well with the, with the uh, with the new processor. I mean, in some cases, we're talking about a doubling of performance. Yeah, right? and it's. Um... I mean, obviously the use case is a very strange one. I have this odd affinity for playing old games at extremely high refresh rates and extremely high <laughs> frame rates and doing weird things there. Uh, but that shows basically how that single threaded performance, when it comes through, I th and I really think it is actually cache difference because it doesn't make any sense regarding frequency or their claimed IPC performance gen on gen for Ryzen. It just doesn't make sense. So I think it's actually the game, more of the game code living in the cache instead of spilling out into main memory. And at that point, there's basically huge increases in performance. And something like Halo, which is a very old game, obviously, most of the time running almost two times faster, um, which is awesome. And it was strange back in when I got the Ryzen 1700X. Originally, I was upgrading and side grading on a certain level from a very highly overclocked Core i7-930. But when I played older games, uh, I didn't notice such a huge upgrade with that Ryzen 1700X that I would have expected for such a modern processor. It's just because at that point in time, that was a highly overclocked 930 at 4.2 gigahertz, and I was coming to a 3.5 gigahertz or so um, Ryzen 1700X, which wasn't par for par in terms of IPC with Intel chips at the time. So it was more of a side grade then, and now I'm finally seeing what it's like to have a chip that can just master old games. And I, I frankly loved it, and it's the most fun part of my review. Obviously going back and seeing the games over the year that I've complained about with the Ryzen 1700X's performance, that's interesting in its own right, but for me personally, I was just super excited to finally play the games that I play uh, at the level of performance that I desire. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's good, isn't it? I mean. <laughs> I, there were there were some issues though, right? I mean, obviously yeah. you're dealing with a test bench of problem cases, whereas our benchmarks generally tend to be uh, kind of a, a set series of yeah. mostly modern games or games that we know are heavy on CPU. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, there, there there were some interesting scenarios there. So um, you had big issues with Hitman Two. Yes. Um, and you know, I was looking at your graphs there. And yeah, it's, it's, you know, obviously it's an improvement, but it's not a game changer. You know, you're not getting, uh, you know, the, the, the frequencies on the 3900X plus the extra cores. No, no. And no. I think you have it down as like 18, 18 to 20 percent better. That's not really a game changer. Yeah, that's, that's kind of average. And it almost seems like that's the frequency advantage plus a little bit extra that you see going up from the 1700X to the 3900X, which is not exactly what you'd expect for a game that was also eventually released a DX12 patch, which should presumably take advantage of all of those threads and extra cores, so much so. And instead, you're just kind of seeing a slight upgrade, which is, I would actually say, rather disappointing because there's still moments in that DirectX 12 benchmark, which is, you know, heavily threaded, and taking advantage of that CPU, definitely, because it's so much faster than DX11. It's still just like a couple times on the cusp of 60 for the 3900X, which is a bit scary because under the impression that this is actually a well-coded DirectX 12 game, and I presume it is, uh, what happens then we have next-gen games also kind of utilizing the CPU in a much more, I would say, total fashion. Are we gonna start seeing games that um, are below 60 FPS for some reason, because it's kind of scared me when I got to that part of the benchmarking when I was seeing it's still a tiny bit above 60, and this is a modern game. Future games, that got me a little worried, but mm. there were other uh, case examples that I had in there, specifically Battlefield 5 under DX12 and utilizing ray tracing, which totally increases the amount of draw calls the game is using. And the Ryzen 1700X was really failing to make a consistent 60 FPS performance there in 64 player multiplayer game when there was lots of reflections on the screen. It basically was yep. impossible and the, the frame time graph was all over the place with stutters. Let's get this clear. To, in order to produce those reflections, it actually has to produce all of the surrounding geometry in order to reflect it. Yeah, it does, because it's tracing into that structure and it needs to know. I mean, technically it could trace into just what's on the screen, but it wouldn't be any different from SSR. So they need to still draw those things behind your player. And in Battlefield, they created a really cool heuristic 
of determining based upon distance and importance which objects to draw in around the player. Um, in that case, it meant just so many more draw calls, and that's one thing that they were talking about at Gamescom last year with us, that they were a little bit worried about that. And they did increase the CPU spec, uh, recommended spec for the DXR version of the game. Right. It, it went up to a 2700X, I think. So according to your tests, 35% uh, uh, improvement from the yeah. 30 and 900 X to the 17, which is uh, you know that's good. Awesome, yeah, it? it's <laughs> that's the time where I'm thinking we're also seeing the the threat advantage actually coming in. It seems like Frostbite games have always actually been just taking advantage of all the threads they can get their hands upon, and in yeah. this game, especially where the you know the DX Dex 12 draw call model is all about taking advantage of as many threads as possible, and I think that's the area where we're seeing the 3900 X actually perform better. And if I recall, mm -hmm. actually taking a look at our 3900X to um, 3700X bench benchmarks, it's a little bit better, actually, for... A little bit a better. Little bit yeah, better but but this isn't DXR, that's the thing. Yeah, that this isn't DXR. This is not yeah. DXR. Um, yeah, so... And, uh, yeah, that is a bit of a weird one. I mean, <laughs> uh, we can roll the benchmark out now. It, it's a total mess. Uh, I mean, what happens... Well, when you're GPU-bound, fundamentally, one frame isn't that much different from the next. It takes roughly the same amount of time to process, so you get consistent frame times, right? But with when you're CPU bound, you can be crashing into any part of the simulation, producing all sorts of stutters. You can hit storage as a limitation even. So it's really, I mean, this is why you kind of want to either hit a predetermined frame rate limiter or you want to be GPU bound because then you will get consistency. But this Battlefield benchmark, I mean, <laughs> fundamentally, when you actually render out the graphs and look at what is being generated, yeah. it's a total mess. <laughs> yeah, it's not a fun game experience, which is always, we'll, we'll have to talk about high frame rate gaming again very soon, I think, um, but. Yeah, well, you know, as you know, I've just, well, you know, just to forewarn everyone, I have done a sponsored video about high frame rate gaming, which I don't think anybody is going to have any particular issues with the conclusions of no. it because it's fundamentally pretty basic stuff. But having done all of these tests, I noticed, you know, in your piece, it was basically, can we lock to 60 FPS on anything? And I think we're, we're swiftly reaching the point now where 60 FPS is kind of like the, the base minimum, mm -hmm. as it were. And to reference that in terms of $300, $500 processors, kind of weird, right? It is actually a little depressing, and that was... <laughs> <laughs> I, I do get worried for next gen. I am actually pretty worried for next gen based upon all these things we've... Other than a game like, I would say, like, Wolfenstein, like, that's the only one where it basically always seems like it's going to be GPU limited for the most part. Um, it is stupidly fast, yeah, yeah. We, well, we can talk about this for a minute because it is an interesting topic. Um, if we look at the specs for the consoles mm -hmm. and the Gonzalo processor in particular, which many believe is the PlayStation 5 SoC, um, eight cores, 16 threads, and that is essentially a downclocked 3700X. Basically. So, yeah, I mean, I've got two concerns about next gen. Um, first of all, the baseline for um, a console experience on PC is going to be much higher because, you know, developers are going to be developing for eight cores and 16 <laughs> threads, which is insane. So, I mean, do we need one of these processors to get, you know, console parity? That is a bit of an issue for me. Yeah. Um, and secondly, um, games typically have far more scalability in GPU options than they do in CPU options. So let's say, for the sake of argument, that the PlayStation 5 has the power of 5700 Navi. I'm just coming up with that as an example. I'm, don't hold me to it. <laughs> it could be likely, though. I mean, let's say, I mean, these games are going to be targeting something approaching 4K. So hey, if I've got a weaker GPU, no problem. I'll just run it at 1080p. Maybe I've got a 1080p screen or maybe, you know, I'll downgrade the shadows or whatever or the lighting model and, and I'm good to go. But you can't, you don't have that level of scalability with um, with the CPU side. No. So, yeah, that, that's my concern for PC gaming. I think this is possibly a, a video we should do at some point. I I like that idea a lot. <laughs> to, to address the implications of what the next gen consoles represent, I mean, going back to the 2013, you know, we had the Jaguars 
uh, which, you know, weren't any kind of threat. <laughs> No. <laughs> whatsoever no. to like even in the i3s of the time obviously cpu utilization has got a lot better and you know mm -hmm. they, they're working i've got to hand it to developers they're working miracles from jaguar i mean i really do have to do that video of uh, jaguar being cpu bound in windows <laughs> <'cause> it, <laughs> that's that situation i guess that's a separate argument altogether yeah and then we have this kind of curious situation where Ryzen isn't doing as well as Intel at the moment in gaming still. I mean, yeah. the gap has closed. I think we, we can both agree on that. But um, will Ryzen's fortunes improve because all of these games are going to be running on consoles based on Ryzen technology? What do you make of that? We talked about this before, and I did enjoy that you brought up the Jaguar argument again and you were back at the start of the gen, how will six core and eight core bulldozer CPUs now fare that Jaguar is in the consoles? And they didn't fare well at all. That's, That's the thing. Right, yeah. And so maybe we'll just have a situation where Ryzen performs, you know, well and expectingly well, but it doesn't thrive or excel next gen in comparison to Intel. And maybe Intel's advantage still actually maintains the same because I think what we're looking for here in these graphs where we see the 9900K scaling better than the 9700K, uh, mm. that's just hyper-threading, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. we don't see that necessarily on the 3900X from the 3700X. Um, so something's going on there regarding game performance that the extra threads on Ryzen and those, ex you know, those extra cores even are not doing actually that much for performance. There's some other hang up there and I really still think it is actually single threaded performance. There's only so much, or at least I would say extractable performance from those threads. Those threads on Intel are very fast. They're less fast on Ryzen. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing there. And when we look at next gen, I, I actually still think we're just gonna see that Intel advantage at the moment, staying, at, staying as it is. I would like to be proven mm -hmm. wrong though. That's the one thing I really wanna be proven wrong. <laughs> Because I'm on a 3900X now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so selfish, Alex. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> but so I think, yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you there. I've got several thoughts on this. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, the, the problem with the Jaguar as this generation has been lack of IPC and, uh, well, the fact that they're essentially cobbled together mobile cores yeah. running at really low frequencies uh, you know even the xbox one x is like 2.3 gigahertz this isn't this is not great <laughs> so you know we kind of expected engine design to go wider to concentrate on more cores and more threads as opposed to ipc and we have seen that the the, the issue is that it turns out that Combining that advantage with an Intel processor with its IPC advantages, you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting IPC advantages on like the main render and simulation threads, uh, which power a lot of games, but all of the, you know, the supplementary threads are benefiting as well. So, you know, actually going wide is good, yeah. um, but it's not as good as going wide and faster. So, <laughs> yeah. What I do think, though, is that we're seeing a kind of law of diminishing returns as we go wider with the current generation engines, even though they are, you know, N-way threaded. You know, we're, we're seeing, I mean, if we look at The Witcher 3, for example, you can see that this is one of the games where I think I log at 1080p, something like a 9% uh, advantage to the 3900X, which means, which is, you know, which is fairly impressive, but it's, it is a law of diminishing returns there. But... I mean, holy crap, I mean, the 9900K at points in this benchmark, you know, the, the Novigrad benchmark, the classic <laughs> uh, benchmark that kills performance, I think it peaks at <laughs> like 220 frames per second uh, on the 9900K. It's yeah. just insane. So this is an example, I think, uh, where, where IPC plus um, threads really is making a difference. And when you look at that one in particular, you kind of think to yourself, this is an engine that should be thriving on Ryzen. You know, obviously it's N-way threaded. It, it, it will soak up whatever you throw at it. But for some reason, Ryzen is still behind. And, and the other thing which I find really curious and always have about Ryzen is that when you look at uh, most of the standard benchmarks, video encoding benchmarks, it's faster than Intel. Yeah. 
Um, but when you get into gaming, Intel can, can be, you know, a relatively decent 10% away or anything up to 30% yeah. in the most extreme cases. I think it's just the fact that you're getting possibly, depending on your use case scenario, a more rounded package from AMD. Yeah, that's basically for me, it's the perfect thing. I'm For my videos, I am targeting 60 FPS. That's all I can really reasonably show on YouTube usually. And yeah. that that's what I need. And I'm finally getting that. And also I get the bonus advantage of having incredible production times now in comparison to the past. That's that's a great use case. And I, that, that's what I think makes Ryzen so compelling. Uh, I'm just looking over the benchmarks to see if there's anything we've missed here. Um, obviously, we've got Metro Exodus, which actually seems to be slightly slower than the 3700X, yeah. which is a bit baffling. I mean, we should maybe one day take a look at the, I guess, kind of maintaining a game on certain threads using something like Project Lasso to make all of the game stay on one CCX of Ryzen. Well, that and see was supposed that's... to be what the new Windows scheduler was doing. Yeah, it was yeah. supposed to be grouping threads together um, to be more Ryzen friendly. Um, I can't say I've seen a huge boost from that. Um, there was various claims from AMD about Rocket League being a huge improvement. Mm. I don't know about that. Um, but, you know, we have benched everything from the uh, from scratch for our Ryzen 3000 coverage uh, yeah. in order to, to, to make use of those advantages if they are there. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'm looking at the 3700X here and, you know, there can be scenarios. I mean, even when we look at the horrific <laughs> <laughs> Kingdom Come Deliverance. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, um, I know. It's yeah, brutal. this is actually a benchmark I think you helped me devise. It's just crippling, isn't it? It's it's a combination of CryEngine grass plus all that AI plus moving really quickly through a town where it has to simulate all these things and it just destroys CPUs. That's the one that's an area where I was actually surprised that the Ryzen 3900X did not see an advantage so much so over the 3700X. Yeah, but, but that said, if I'm looking at the stats here and comparing the 3700X at the bottom of the stack to the 9900K at the top of the stack, mm -hmm. the uh, there's only a 10% delta there. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that, that is baffling. I mean, obviously, we've got the footage running now and it looks horrible uh, in terms of those frame times. That is kind of like a really interesting workload. I'd love to know why it's like that. So, Ryzen, you're obviously, many times in the past, I've said you've not been a happy camper. No. But... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, much to, I would say, disappointing the audience. Every single time I'd say something in the comments, there'd be some, there's be a small contingent being like, you, you hate Ryzen. And it's like, no, I, I'm a big fan. It's just when I can't get 60 FPS for a video and I'm showing you against a console version that is 60 FPS, it doesn't look great. <laughs> so that's what I was always disappointed in mainly. But um, I'm my final verdict, I would say here though, for this 3900X is it's glowing. I, I really enjoy everything that I've seen from it so far. Even my boot times are faster on the board, which I really enjoy. Um, you know, just tiny little things and no problems so far. So is, is that down to, because obviously you've kitted yourself out with an NVMe yes, drive yeah, yeah. for this one. So is that, is that running Windows? That is currently running Windows. Um, and But for my benchmarks, I actually did, to keep it par for par, I did actually use that same SSD and install the games to it. So I wanted to keep it literally par for par in every component, minus the board and the, and the CPU. So that's the 3900X, Alex, but uh, based on the review of the 3700X and the benchmarks you've seen and you know, the package you're getting, price is good, the cooler is good. And of course, as I said earlier, mid-range boards can run faster memory too, which helps performance. So yeah, what do you think of that $330 processor? If you're just a gamer, I would say the 3700X is a great 60 FPS GPU with chances for, for older games especially. Uh, to you know, be a great high frame rate uh, machine as well. Yeah, yeah we actually had that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that CS:GO benchmark. Yeah, <laughs> I had to do this because uh, a AMD said, "Oh, CS:GO is thirty-one percent faster," mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, wow, um, that's kind of not going to be explained by frequency or IPC advantages. So I've got to test this out, and lo and behold, I mean, it's still not quite as fast as Intel, but it's it is scarily fast. Yeah, it's. Uh... I think it is that cache thing that we've, we talked about earlier, older games being able to take advantage of that, uh, which, you know, 
I'm, I'm happy that that exists, but still, it's still not as good as Intel. So maybe that's just frequency there at that point. You can't get those crazy yeah. 4.5, 5 gigahertz Intel chips, whatever out there. Yeah. I'm hoping to take a look at the 9900KS, which I believe is an all-core turbo out of the box at 5 gigahertz, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which, you know, yeah. I, I have enjoyed that on, on my 9900K, but, you know, the fact that you're getting it out of the box is, is pretty insane. So we are going to be looking at that, but I am enjoying the, the competition that Verizon is bringing to the market. And I am enjoying um, the, the fact that things have got to change on the Intel side. I mean, it's like in the UK, 480 pounds for a 9900K, that, that can't, surely can't continue. No. So I'm hoping that we'll see some uh, shake up of the market there. And, and I'm going to be curious to see where companies go next. But yeah, I think that's where we're going to leave uh, the Ryzen 3900X for now. You are basically in possession of absolute AMD power. <laughs> the top of the line at the moment. And I'm very happy for it. It's, uh, it's going to make my life easier. And I can, I'm probably going to replay Crisis, by the way. Uh, with it right. Because, yeah, we've got to talk about crisis yeah. because um, obviously there's the shrine in your. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say it's in the background right now, but it might be in the background right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was a game where you were hitting what forty-ish, uh, forty-five. Yeah, God, yeah. And um, there, on the other hand, just the upgrade. I mean, there's still going to be game scenes. Crisis is not a balanced game at all. I mean, we've talked about Ascension before. Just nothing's going to run that at 60 fps for a long time um but but most of the gameplay now that is these smaller ai encounters is actually going to be above 60 which that's the first time i've ever experienced that in my entire life because i don't have a 5 gigahertz 8700k or anything like that um, mm -hmm. so i'm going to be playing that again um, but there's still those scenes you know where a little bit more comes out the draw distance increases and it's going to be just a little bit below 60 which is you know, really good for if you have a variable refresh rate display, but I'll be probably playing like, and I'm playing Crisis for some reason 12 years later, so. Wow. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> okay, well, right. well let's, let's move on and uh, close this one out with a quick discussion on what you're doing next week. What are you doing next week? I actually had an email today. Do you want me to read it? Oh, sure. It's from somebody called Tom. I'm assuming it's not Tom Morgan, but let's not, <laughs> let's not rule it out. I was just wondering, when is the next tech focus, question <laughs> mark? There hasn't been one in a while. No, there Just hasn't. curious if there are any plans. Ooh, um, actually there is because SIGGRAPH just happened. And also we did our kind of half yearly meeting in Brighton and we discussed a lot of topics and it was re about returning to passion projects. And for me, tech focus is a passion project. That's something I like doing. And with SIGGRAPH, there were a lot of papers out there discussing the latest advancements in rendering. And one of them that kind of caught my eye was how the atmospheric and volumetric rendering was done in Red Dead Redemption 2. And I have always wanted to cover how volumetric lighting or rendering is done in games, historically up until now. So I was thinking of a tech focus, why does you know, the sky look so good in Red Redemption 2? And then kind of going back in time to describe what it was like back in the day and then what it is like now and kind of going going through it all. Are we going to uh, cover uh, Assassin's, <laughs> Assassin's Creed Odyssey's uh, cloud system? In I mean, I will talk about how expensive it is. Then that's a perfect example of why it's so hard to do because when you do it right, you can make it extremely expensive while not looking too much different than something much cheaper. Um, yeah, that is one of the classic settings tweaks of all time, yeah. I think. I think back in the day, you had like a 30% performance advantage by dialing back the volumetric cloud. And you can't even, you can't even see it, basically. Um, and uh, how about yourself? What are you working on there? Well, I have just finished overclocking the switch um, in docked mode, Ooh. and I've had a lot of fun with that. There are some insane conclusions drawn from that specifically. No, I'm not going to spoil it. Uh, look out for that one if it's not on the channel already. <laughs> uh, beyond that, there's a lot of things happening um, that uh, I've been kind of trailing in the past. Um, but I think what's going to trump it is the fact that I have the new Switch Ooh. coming early next week, uh, which is essentially the current Switch with the new T210B processor. 
increased battery life. I have a lot of questions about that unit and this is the first time we're going to actually be able to go hands-on with the new version of the processor. Um, so any final words before we sign off? Um, I'm super happy that I have a new Ryzen. That's about it, basically. <laughs> yeah, I, I have been uh, taunting and goading you about it all week. <laughs> In, well a, in, a, in a happy, of course. Uh, friendly, friendly. non-harassment sort of way before HR get involved. It's what chums do, uh, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, I'm really happy that we're actually going to continue to see more Ryzen coverage yeah. uh, from, from you here. And anyway, right, I'm going to sign off for now. Please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Ring the bell, of course, of course instant notifications whenever the new Digital Foundry arrives on the channel. Uh, do consider the DF Patreon if you want to see uh, more in-depth stuff. I mean, we really need the support there in order to produce the content we want to produce on our terms. Um, but that's all from us for now. And uh, well, we'll see you next week. But for now, thanks for watching.